Let's now move into Chapter 9 where we left off. I'm assuming now you all understand the sometimes complex terminology that goes along with these muscle cells on the microscopic level, and you're ready to look at how all of these can interact together to lead to a muscle contraction. I'm going to go through your notes first, starting from this slide that we left off on, and then I'm going to show you some resources in your Mastering A&P site, some videos that I think are really helpful, but I want you to listen to me explain it before you listen to Mastering A&P explain it. They, they explain it using a little bit um, more terminology than I will, so I want you to start with me and then move on to the Mastering A&P. When we look at what has to happen for a skeletal muscle to contract, your textbook separates it into two regions. First, you have to activate at the neuromuscular junction. This is the area where a nerve, a, the terminus, the end of a nerve, interacts with a muscle fiber. If you haven't gone over how nerves send impulses yet, but I want you right now to think of the nerve is sending an electrical signal from the brain down the spinal cord, out a nerve, and to the muscle. You cannot allow in your body that electrical signal to jump from one type of cell to another. So there has to be some sort of interaction at the neuromuscular junction where something is going to come out of the nerve and activate the muscle cell. The second thing that must happen is what we call excitation contraction coupling. In here, there's going to be two things that occur. We must have depolarization of the muscle cell. This means we have to learn how action potentials work. And as well, in this part of the muscle contraction, we have to have calcium. So there's really three things that go on for a muscle to contract. We're going to release something from our nerve, we're going to depolarize our muscle cell, and we're going to raise the level of calcium inside of our muscle cell. What's going to happen at the neuromuscular junction, I'm going to flip to the picture to go over a few things, and we'll kind of flip back and forth. This here in the picture, this represents the end of your nerve. As the electrical signal comes down from the brain and interacts here at the end, some calcium, some molecules are going to move in, telling the nerve to spit out a molecule that can interact with your muscle cell. Down here, this is your sarcolemma, your plasma membrane of one muscle cell. The area between the terminus, the end of the axon, the end of the nerve, and your muscle cell, this space is called the synaptic cleft. When the signal gets to the end of the nerve, the molecule released into the synaptic cleft, the space, is called ACH. This stands for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has one job. That acetylcholine is going to come down here and bind to an acetylcholine receptor that is actually more of a sodium channel. This is the steps that occur at the neuromuscular junction to lead to contraction. Once the signal gets to the end of the nerve, the nerve releases acetylcholine, and acetylcholine binds the muscle cell. The acetylcholine never itself goes into the muscle cell. It just binds on the outside. Now, using this same picture, we can look at how depolarization moving on into the excitation coupling part of this, this um, physiology. Now, but first we've got to recall something from your basic biology classes. All cells in your body have what's called a sodium-potassium pump. These are found on every cell in your body, and they have a very important job. Their job is to pump three molecules of sodium, which is the Na+, out of your cell and dump two potassium molecules, which is the K plus here, into your cell. Okay? There are none of these ATPases shown on this picture. I'm just trying to set up where we're going. Think about it this way. If every time your ATPase works, it throws three sodium molecules, so it throws three pluses out of the cell and allows two pluses into the cell, 
where is your cell going to be more positively charged? On the outside. Because you've been throwing three molecules that are positively charged outside every time you throw two in. So at what we call the resting state of a cell, the inside of your cell is more negative than the outside of your cell. If we were to change this charge distribution, it would affect how that, how that cell functioned. And that's what we're about to do here. So we have to understand that we normally have more sodium on the outside, more potassium on the inside, and at resting state, this muscle fiber is more negative on the inside. So let's pick back up with our excitation coupling. We said we understood that the acetylcholine binds here to the receptor. When acetylcholine binds, it causes that acetylcholine receptor, that sodium channel, to open. And what did we learn? Where is there more sodium? On the outside. So if you open this channel here, sodium, which is positively charged, is going to come flooding into the inside of the cell. If you now have a ton of positive charges flooding into this cell, what's going to happen to your charge state? Now you're going to have more positive molecules on the inside than the outside. So we have switched the charge state of our membrane. This is called depolarizing the membrane. Once we depolarize the membrane in this one area, that will cause another sodium channel to open. More sodium will flood in. Now we've changed the membrane state here. More positive on the inside, more negative on the outside. This is now beginning what we call the action potential, where this depolarization, this change in charge state across the membrane, is going to move all the way down our muscle fiber. So now we've completed step two. Step one, we release acetylcholine. It bounds to the sodium channel. Step two, the sodium floods in, causes our membrane to depolarize, and then the depolarization continues leading to an action potential, a switch in charge state all the way down the cell. This graph here shows us the action potential. So we're looking at one particular place on the muscle fiber membrane. In this area, at negative 70, this is where we're looking at the inside of the cell. At resting state, it's more negative on the inside. Then whenever the signal is received from acetylcholine, so right here, this is where acetylcholine is going to bind to the sodium channel. Sodium channel opens, sodium starts flooding in, and the inside of the cell becomes more positively charged. So this part of the graph here represents the depolarization. Going back and looking at what we've done so far, you must be starting to wonder, if these things must happen for my cell to contract, then I'm going to have something that's almost the reverse of this to make my cell relax. And that is very true. First, let's look at the acetylcholine. As long as that acetylcholine is bound here to the sodium channel, it's open, and our cell is going to depolarize. So if our muscle is going to relax back here at this area, remember the action potential has already continued. So the rest of this muscle is contracting. We've got to get this part of it back to normal so it can have another contraction when it's ready. So we need to be able to get rid of these acetylcholine molecules when we're ready for them to go away. And we do that with a combination of two things. Some of the whole acetylcholine molecules are sucked back into the nerve so they can be reused. Or we have little enzymes called acetylcholine esterase that can break these acetylcholine molecules down. And then we can suck the pieces back in, rebuild it, and use it again. Just taking the acetylcholine away, though, is not going to fix the fact that we've allowed tons of positive charges to move into our muscle cell, right? So we've got to have a way to repolarize or get the membrane back to its resting charge state. So we've got to have a way to get it back to the normal, more negative on the inside, more positive on the outside. 
If we close our sodium channel, that helps some. But we've still got to get some positives to go out. So to repolarize your membrane, we open a potassium channel. Then the potassium, which is positively charged, can flood out of the cell, cell reestablishing the resting state, which is shown here. Negative on the inside, positive on the outside. So now if we look back at our action potential graph, we can see that at one place, we're at resting state, negative on the inside, acetylcholine binds, sodium channels open, sodium floods in, we depolarize our membrane. Once we've depolarized in one area, that will depolarize the next area. So the original area where the depolarization began, we are going to have to repolarize that area. So those sodium channels, the first ones that opened, close. Potassium channels open. Potassium floods out of our cell. And you can see the line here. We start going more and more negative, getting back to resting state. Eventually, we do need to close our potassium channels. But haven't we just messed up our muscle cell? Now we've got more sodiums on the inside, more potassiums on the outside. How can we fix that? Remember, we have our ATPase. The whole time this is going on, that little ATPase is over there shoveling three sodiums out, bringing two potassiums back in. So that ATPase, it's going to fix it eventually. It's going to get the sodium and potassium into the right direction. Now, unfortunately, we're not finished yet, right? We still have not shortened our sarcomere. To see how this happens, we've got to see how the propagation or movement of the action potential, movement of the depolarization down the muscle cell can interact with our sarcomere. If we look here, this is a T-tubule the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane dipping down into the muscle cell. And remember, right next to it, we have sarcoplasmic reticulum. Underneath all of this, this is a myofibril, so you have the sarcomere, thick filaments, thin filaments. So here comes this action potential that we just said we, we established. We've depolarized the membrane, and it's moving down our muscle cell. The depolarization moves down. And I like to think of it as the switching of charges moves down the muscle cell. It's almost shocking with an electrical charge what it comes in contact with. So when the depolarized cell gets to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to release many molecules of calcium. The calcium now inside of the cell will interact with our thin filament. Calcium binds troponin. That causes the tropomyosin to switch conformations and move out of the way. Now our myosin head can reach up, grab the actin. So here in the first image, tropomyosin's in the way. But when the calcium, the little red balls, bind the troponin, it moves tropomyosin out of the way. Now the myosin head can bind to the actin, and we get the movement. The myosin head actually pulls on the thin filament. Because remember, go all the way back to that sliding filament theory. We've got to pull those actin filaments closer and closer, getting rid of that H zone. The actin gets closer and closer to the M line. So are we done? Unfortunately not. We have one more step. Our ATP has to come into play. The ATP is going to be what we need to continue to make that muscle shorten. So once the calcium binds the troponin, it moves the tropomyosin out of the way. Myosin head reaches up, grabs the actin, and pulls. Whenever the myosin pulls, that is called the power stroke. That's when the myosin uses the ATP. So we see this ADP and phosphate falling off. That represents the use of ATP. But now we're stuck, right? The myosin head is bound to the actin, and it has pulled some. We need it to let go so it can grab further up the actin molecule and pull again. 
What allows the myosin head to let go is binding of a new molecule of ATP. Then the myosin head can grab actin again. We start over. Use the ATP pull. New ATP comes in. Myosin head detaches. We cock it, bind again, and so on and so forth. This continues until the actin molecules here are almost touching each other. So now I have this slide for you that gives you a summary of all the steps that have happened for this muscle contraction to happen. In black are the steps required for a contraction. In red are the steps that are required to stop the contraction. I highly recommend that you get to the point that you can go through these steps in your mind and understand how one step leads to the next. What I want to do now is show you something very useful. This is in Mastering A&P, and I've gone to the My Study area, My A&P. Normally when you come here, you use PAL or something like that over here to the side. What you can do now is click on this drop-down menu and choose Chapter 9. You then have three very good animations called your A&P flicks. I'm going to go through them with you now, show you some things, but I recommend that you watch these over and over and over again until you truly understand what's going on. It's broken down into the three parts. So here we go. Events at the neuromuscular junction. The brain sent the signal down the spinal cord out a nerve muscle contracted and shortened. So now let's look more microscopic. Here's the signal from the brain, electrical signal. Once it hits the skeletal muscle fiber, you saw that white. That is representing the action potential moving all the way down the muscle fiber. In real life, the end of each nerve interacts with the muscle fiber in more than one place. These are all considered axon terminals. The area where the axon terminal interacts with the muscle cell is called the motor end plate. I'm going to pause it for just a second to make sure we understand what we're looking at. This is the end of the nerve. This is the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. The purple things are your sodium channels. That is what your acetylcholine is going to interact with. So now if we let our animation continue, you're going to see the signal come from the brain. Step one. Here it comes. When the signal gets to the end of the axon, this is now where we're going to have our acetylcholine come into play. The signal getting to the end of the axon causes some molecules to come in. When those calcium molecules come in, that tells the nerve, time to do something. So the nerve is going to release the acetylcholine. That's these little brown circles. You can see that not just one acetylcholine comes out of the muscle. Thousands come out at once. Now here's all our little acetylcholines down here. They're going to bind to the now green, I don't know why they changed the color, acetylcholine receptors. These are sodium channels. Once the acetylcholine binds, that makes the channel open. Once the channel opens, since there's more sodium on the outside, the red, they're going to come flooding in. Now, yes, I see that there are some other molecules coming out, right? There are a few potassiums that escape. That's simply because the sodium and potassium molecules are kind of similar. But you can see there's a whole lot more sodium movement going on than potassium movement. So when we open those channels, we've now made the inside of the cell more positively charged. We've depolarized the membrane here, and bam, there it goes. The depolarization continues down the entire muscle fiber, and we have an action potential. To fix this, or to make the muscle relax, we got to get rid of this acetylcholine. So some of them are just sucked back into the axon. The other ones that get left behind are going to be degraded by the little enzyme. Here comes our Pac-Man, acetylcholine esterase. He breaks down the ones that are left because we need those acetylcholine molecules to let go, stop.
stop bonding to the sodium channels when we're ready for our muscle to repolarize. So let's go to the next part. Our next video again, they're going to show you from the beginning. Brain sends a signal down the nerve. We depolarize the initial spot on the muscle. Then the depolarization continues all the way down the muscle fiber. Now we're going to look at how this depolarization couples to the release of calcium. So here what look like honeycombs almost. This is the T tubules, the transverse tubules, which are just pieces of the sarcolemma that dip down into the entire muscle fiber. That's what's shown here in yellow. So as the depolarization moves down the muscle cell, it also dips deep into the interior of the muscle fiber. What is shown here in purple, that's your sarcoplasmic reticulum full of calcium molecules. So we're going to go a little closer. Again, here's the T-tubule. This is your sarcoplasmic reticulum. We're going to see the depolarization move down the T-tubule. Now the depolarization kind of shocks the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, once it senses the depolarization of the membrane, it opens up the calcium channels, and the calcium is going to be allowed to flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the muscle cell, the interior of the muscle cell. There it goes. Our muscle can now contract. But now we need to look at what's actually going on. What is that calcium doing? And that's our third video, the cross bridge cycle. In this third video, we're going to look at once the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium, how the calcium interacts with the myofibril. So pause it for just a second to make sure we review our anatomy and we understand. This is one myofibril inside of the muscle cell. So here's the dark spot. That's the A band. That's where you have myosin and actin. In the center of this, this is your H zone. Then you have a light area here. That's your I band. This dark spot in the middle of the I band, that's a Z disc. So you can watch as the muscle shortens, the I band disappears. See how the light area disappears, muscle relaxes, light area reappears. When we're looking here, the pinkish looking areas, those are your thick filaments made of myosin. The yellow looking areas, those are your thin filaments made of actin with the tropomycin and troponin. So now let's look a little closer. The yellow, that's your actin. The blue is troponin. The green is tropomyosin. So here come those calcium molecules. They bind to troponin. Once the calcium binds to troponin, it's going to cause a change in conformation, and watch how the tropomyosin moved out of the way. If I go back just a little bit, see now this myosin head, it cannot grab the actin right now. The tropomyosin is in the way. But now it switches. Now the myosin head can reach up, grab the actin molecule, and we can have a contraction. Remember, this myosin head also has a binding site for ATP. The ATP is going to have to be used or broken down in order for movement to occur. The binding of myosin to actin occurred because tropomyosin moved. In order to move the myosin head, we're going to have to see how the ATP itself is going to be used. So here we go again. We're going to build our cross bridge. Tropomyosin's out of the way. So myosin in red binds actin. Now we break down ATP. We use energy so we get what's called the power stroke. This myosin is going to physically pull on the actin. 
allowing our sarcomere to begin to shorten. So that's one power stroke. Now it's kind of stuck. So a new ATP molecule has to come along. When the new ATP molecule binds to the myosin, that causes the myosin head to detach. When it lets go, it can then reactivate, meaning cock, rebind to a new actin molecule, and then we can see the cycle start over again. It can pull again. So here we go. You can see them going. Every time one of those little myosin heads is grabbing and pulling on that actin, you see those ATPs are being used over and over and over again. See how it's just kind of crawling along. In order for this to stop, all we need is the calcium to be reabsorbed into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. While we're watching this video, let's think about what happens if you run out of ATP. If your muscles contracted and you have no more ATP, then you lose the ability to make your myosin head detach. That's what actually happens in rigor mortis. When a person dies, they kind of stiffen their entire body, all their muscles contract. That's because they no longer have the ability to produce ATP, so their muscles kind of get stuck. Again, I highly recommend you watch these videos several times and make sure you can understand all of these steps that I've provided for you in the summary occurring throughout the video.